I shall begin my talk, which is entitled Clean Agile, Back to Basics. Uh, last year or so, I wrote a book on this topic because I got rather frustrated with everything that was going on in the agile world. And, and in fact, this is the in introductory image uh, in that book, uh, which is me telling all the young new agile kids to get the hell off my lawn. Um, I, I'm going to go through my own personal recollections of the last 20 years, which are all post-agile, of course. And uh, for those of you who are non-programmers, and for those of you who are programmers, this talk is entirely non-technical. Uh, I'm just going to be going through what agile was back then, how it started, and, and what agile ought to be today, at least in my uh, limited opinion. Agile began as a small idea, not a big idea. It's a small idea about the small problem of small programming teams doing small things. This, it was not some grandiose way to solve all software ills forever. The real problem we were having at the time was how the heck do you get five or six people to, to do a, a moderately small project without you know, completely losing control and, and going off the end of the world. It's a small idea that actually came out of the 1950s when all software was small. And we lost this idea in the 70s because software began to grow and new ideas infiltrated and took us off the rails. And we're gonna talk about why that happened and then how Agile came back. There was this bizarre discontinuity in the 1970s. Uh, prior to the 1970s, the number of programmers was vanishingly small. I mean, there were a few thousand programmers in the world, maybe 10,000. The number of computers in the world could probably have been counted uh, in, in, in uh, 10 bits. <laughs> you know, <laughs> probably less than a thousand computers in the world in the early 70s or maybe the late 60s, you know, something like that. And the number of programmers was, was also vanishingly small. But, but the number of computers and the number of programmers has been on an exponential growth curve for the last 70 years. And the knee of that curve was in the 70s. And something happened at the knee of the curve. An impossibly young cohort of 20-somethings happened to the programmers in the world. Prior to that, most of the programmers in the world were old. They were in their 30s and 40s and 50s, and they, they, hadn't, they didn't go to school to learn how to be programmers, right? Because there weren't any classes. You, you couldn't get a degree in computer science. None of the professors knew what programming was. If you wanted to be a programmer in the 1950s or the 1960s, you just picked up a book and there weren't many books and you read and then you played and then you did trial and error and you finally figured out how these machines worked. And fortunately, the machines were so simple back then that you could figure it all out <laughs> and, and work out how to be a programmer. Then the 70s came and the machines exploded everywhere, the mini computers showed up and there were tens of thousands of those and and uh, there were college courses and people poured out of university with CS degrees or double E degrees with a computer bent to them and a horde of 20 somethings entered the field and that created an interesting problem but I get ahead of myself so let me continue on. From the 70s to the 90s was kind of the dark ages. Um, we, uh, we went off the rails and I'll, I'll explain why we went off the rails uh, a little bit later. And then there was a reawakening in the mid nineties. And this was the agile reawakening. Uh, it began around 1995 um, and it changed almost everything. And a number of things happened during that period until, until the meeting at Snowbird in 2001, which actually uh, lit the real fuse and made everything take off for better or for worse. Since that lighting of the fuse 20 years ago, <clears throat> the idea has gotten muddled. 
No, not by any ill intent. I mean, every, everybody out there is just trying to improve things. And, and one of the ways you improve things is to put an adjective in front of it. And so now we have lean and Kanban and safe and less and modern and skilled. And these are not all bad ideas. It's just that they're not the original agile message. And to some extent, the original agile message has gotten lost, at least from my you know, <laughs> curmudgeonly point of view. So I wrote that book to kind of re restate what agile was. There's nothing new in the book and there's nothing new in this talk that I'm gonna give you. Uh, it's just a, just a rehash of what agile was or what I at least thought it was 20 years ago. Before I continue, there's some people that we need to acknowledge. Um, the two people you see here are Kent Beck on the left and Ward Cunningham on the right. The fuse would never have been lit without these two men. Uh, Kent Beck is the guy who coined the term extreme programming. And it was extreme programming that really triggered the Agile revolution. There had been rumblings before. Even the word scrum had been identified by before extreme programming. But it was little attention paid to it until Kent Beck had pushed this extreme programming idea. And where did Kent get the ideas from? Well, many of them came from Ward Cunningham, his mentor. The two of them had worked together at Tektronix. And special, re special regard needs to be paid to Ward Cunningham because in our industry, there have been many revolutions. And if you tr pull the threads on those revolutions, uh, you will find Ward back there somewhere who, who had the germ of the idea. Ward kind of sits in the background and, and spouts off some ideas and, and those ideas get a life of their own and other people take them to uh, extremes. Uh, Ward usually doesn't get the credit, so I, I think he ought to be mentioned. Another mention is um, of Martin Fowler, who during the entire process of the Agile Revolution, was a man whose hand was on the tiller, keeping the course straight, um, neither a, an extremist nor a, a dissenter, um, someone who kept his eye on where we were headed and kept the ship in that direction. Uh, and we owe a, grat of, uh, a debt of some gratitude to him. And then there's Ken Schwaber. Ken Schwaber in many ways was the, the business engine that really pushed Agile across the chasm. He's the one who invented the notion of certified scrum masters for better or for worse. And in, and in the early days, it was definitely for the better because it, it gave Agile the opportunity to become extremely well known. Uh, nothing stops Ken Schwaber when he's got a goal in mind. So uh, he needs to be mentioned. Also, I want to mention the Poppendicks, um, Mary and Tom Poppendick. Mary was the first secretary of the, of the Agile Alliance. She did all the work to set up the nonprofit. It was completely thankless work. <laughs> this tremendous amount of effort that she did on a volunteer basis because she wanted to see the improvements done. And Tom, her, her husband and partner forever, uh, was always by her side and was kind of the unofficial photographer of, of of Agile in the early days. Many, many interesting photographs were done by Tom. Um, this is Ron Jeffries. Ron Jeffries was the very first Agile coach ever, uh, very first person given the title Agile coach. And throughout those early days was the, I say it here, the warm and gentle conscience of Agile. If ever we, strayed in directions that were not on the moral center of Agile. It was Ron who would bring us back to that moral center. Whereas Martin Fowler kind of had an outward look with his hand on the tiller. Ron had a kind of inward look with his hand on the tiller. I want to mention Mike Beadle. Mike Beadle who fought the good fought. Uh, fought the good fight, who was there with Ken Schwaber in the early days of Scrum and who joined us at the, at the Agile Alliance meeting, and then who very unfortunately was murdered on the streets of Chicago by a homeless person. Um, his family was left behind. Uh, just good thoughts for Mike Beadle. Many other people should be mentioned. You've already heard from Ari and you've heard from 
John, and you've heard from James Grenning already. There are several others on the list. Alistair Coburn, I'll tell you a little bit more about him as we go along. Jim Highsmith, Andy Hunt, Brian Merrick, you know, uh, Steve Meller, Jeff Sutherland, Dave Thomas. Uh, the group that got together in Snowbird was an extremely unlikely group to get together. Uh, and I'll talk more about that as I go along. Uh, another mention for Jim Newkirk, who was my business partner at the time, who put in tireless effort facing immense personal headwinds. Uh, and uh, my thoughts for him are always warm. This is the team at Object Mentor um, that pushed the, the extreme programming courses way back in 1999 and into 2000 and 2001. Um, the agile message would never have happened without this team. And here is the photograph taken at the first meeting of the Agile Alliance. Uh, and you can see Mary Poppendick to the left and Ken Schwaber, that's me in the middle underneath the Starship Enterprise, Mike Beadle uh, to the right of me, and Jim Highsmith. All right, enough of that reminiscence. The introduction to Agile. Where did this idea come from, this crazy idea? You know, 17 people, very unlikely people, met uh, in 2001 in Snowbird, Utah. Uh, and, and, you know, by the way, meetings like this happen all the time and nothing ever comes of them. <laughs> and, and we didn't expect anything to come of it. It was just a bunch of guys, you know, who got together because we were upset about the deplorable state of software and we just wanted to rant and rave and, and uh, talk to each other about it. And, and how the heck that turned into the movement it did is still a mystery to me, frankly. <laughs> but how did it all begin? When did that happen? So I'm gonna go through a brief history here. And, and this history goes pretty far back in time. So, so we're gonna begin like 50,000 years ago. Um, why? Because humans do things in small steps. I mean, can you imagine the, the killing of the first mastodon? <laughs> the hunters out on the, on the plains of North America and they see a mastodon, a woolly mammoth, and they think, oh, there's meat there. How are we gonna kill that thing? And, and they, they figure out how to do it by making a lot of mistakes, you know, lots of short cycles and little experiments and things like that. And eventually they figure out, oh, you know, maybe we can entice them to fall off a cliff. We don't have to stab them with our spears. Uh, this is an extremely human way of thought, right? Lots of small steps, making small progress at each step, suffering some reversals during some of those steps. It's very agile, it's very human. In modern industry, it's hard to say, you know, <laughs> where agile began, but can you imagine the first steam engine being built without some guy tinkering it together through a bunch of lot of tiny little cycles with lots of feedback and making a lot of dumb mistakes until finally he gets the thing to chug up? Or, or how about the first airplane, right? <laughs> or or the, you know, the first internal combustion engine or any of these things. We know the history of the Wright brothers. We know that that was a series of steps, very faulty steps along the way, but, but you know, tiny little agile maneuvers that eventually got their airplane into the air under powered flight. What about software? Well, I, some of you may have read Alan Turing's paper. If you have not read Alan Turing's paper, please go get Alan Turing's paper and read it. And by the way, there's a wonderful book uh, written by Charles Petzold, it's called the, um, uh, the Annotated Turing. Get that book, read, it's a wonderful book. It, it takes all of Alan Turing's paper, reproduces it, but surrounds it with all the history and, and explanation. Charles is, this is Charles's masterpiece, it really is. Of all the books that Charles Petzold has written, and I know some of you have read quite a few of them, that's the one that is the, the greatest of his works. Um, how did Turing write that paper? There's a lot of code in that paper that never executed on a real machine, right? How did he write that paper? He must have gone through a series of small steps. He must have done it in a way that we would call agile today. We know more about the software of the Mercury space capsule. We know that they worked in short iterations, one day iterations. 
And in fact, they wrote their unit tests in the morning and made them pass in the afternoon. Uh, you can read about that, by the way, in the book that's on your screen. Craig Larman wrote this lovely book in 2000 something or other. Uh, and, and it goes through a lot of the in-depth history of these agile thoughts. The notion of short cycles with lots of feedback as I said, is like 50,000 years old. There was no way it wasn't going to be part of the early days of software. And it was part of the early days of software. The IBM Federal Systems Division actually codified it and, and did quite a few projects like the Minuteman missile system and the Polaris submarine system. They did with this kind of short cycled heavy feedback approach. And, and there is a, a, an old saying that we used to say back in the early days of Agile, which was that Agile is the way that software engineers were observed to behave in the wild. And there's a certain level, level of truth to that. Because if you're a programmer back in those days, <laughs> what else would you do other than kind of stumble forward using lots of short cycles and heavy feedback? But Agile was not the only game in town. There was another thought, and Kent used to do these talks about Frederick Winslow Taylor all the time in the early days of Agile, so I've kind of stolen the idea from him. Um, but this guy, Frederick Winslow Taylor, was the first management consultant to ever be a management consultant and have that title. And his, his way of thought, he called scientific management. And the idea behind scientific management was a brilliant idea. It still is to this day. You observe the way people work. You do experiments with the way people work. For example, let's say you've got a guy digging a hole with a shovel. Well, then you start, you observe how well he digs with the shovel. And then you give him a different shovel with a longer handle and then a different shovel with a wider blade. And then you tell him to dig slower. And then you tell him to dig faster and you observe and you do science. And then you choose the best shovel with the best pace and so forth. And then you have everybody do that. And of course, you improve your efficiency greatly. And Frederick Winslow Taylor took this idea throughout manufacturing industry in the late 1800s and the early 1900s. And it was a revolution. It, it massively improved the efficiency of, of manufacturing. And of course, this was the industrial era and everyone was interested in competing with each other and going faster and faster and more and more efficient. And Fred, Frederick Winslow Taylor was at the head of this. But the idea led to the notion that big projects are done by making a big upfront plan. Big upfront planning was part of Frederick Winslow Taylor's idea, this idea of scientific management. And as you might imagine, that infected software as well. And it happened at the knee of the curve, the knee of that exponential curve in the 1970s, when all of a sudden the projects were getting really bigger <laughs> and the number of programs were getting really big, bigger and the number of programmers were getting really bigger and we hit the crossroads. And the crossroads was this fight should we go on with this kind of half-baked idea of short cycles with lots of feedback that nobody had really written up in any kind of way, but kind of made a lot of good sense if you were a programmer? Should we do that or should we take the road that leads to big upfront plans? Should we do scientific management? And at the crux of that crossroads, we had this lovely dilemma. This pre-agile thing that we were doing back then, short cycles with lots of feedback, but no real named process, was very good for um, projects that had a low cost of change and uh, had requirements that weren't really well defined. <laughs> because you would kind of wiggle your way towards the, the end result. And often the end result was very different than you thought it was going to be going into it, but it was still a good result. So, so that was all right. Um, scientific management, on the other hand, was best for high cost of change projects that were well-defined. Now, what, what's the difference here? Low cost of change. It doesn't, doesn't cost you much to make a change. If it doesn't cost you much to make a change, well, then you can wiggle around. You don't even need to have well-defined requirements. You can just kind of wiggle around and, and end up somewhere. And, and you kind of hope it's good. But if, when you have high cost of change, like, for example, you've laid the foundation of a skyscraper, 
well, changing that foundation is going to be very expensive. And so you really want to have a good upfront plan that nails everything down. And the question at the crossroads in the 1970s was, which of those two types of projects, low cost of change or high cost of change, right? Well-defined or undefined, which of those is software? And right then, a Gallup fellow by the name of Winston Royce wrote the paper. <laughs> now, now it was, it's an odd paper, right? It's a paper called Managing the Development of Large Software Systems. And it became, um, it, well, nowadays we'd say it, it went viral. Uh, things did not go viral on the, on the internet back in 1970 because there was no internet in 1970, at least not one that was publicly around. But, but it, it went viral in another way. But not all of the paper went viral. Just the first page of the paper went viral. You see on the first page uh, was this diagram. And the diagram is extremely rational. Right? You look at that and think, oh yeah, of course, hmm, requirements and then, and then analysis and then design and then coding and then testing. Obviously, that's the way software ought to be done. Now, poor Winston Royce was trying to say that this is a bad approach. <laughs> He went on to, to discuss what a better approach would be, which sounded much more agile than this, but apparently nobody read the paper. What they did is they took that image, the one that you see on your screen right now, and they photocopied it, and they stuck it in the back of document after document after document. It wound up in the end of uh, the Department of Defense's uh, software process document and many, many, many other companies, and the, word, the, the world of waterfall was born. Uh, there are many, many different versions of this history. I'm telling you the one that seems to make the most sense to me. I do know that this picture is photocopied into lots of different documents and the notion of waterfall made sense. Because you see, I was there at the time. This, this is me in the 70s. Um, I was 18, didn't go to college, of course, because the colleges were a mess. The Vietnam War had made it, you know, worthless to go to college. So I had decided to just become a programmer. And I taught myself COBOL and Fortran and PL1 and assembly language before that. So I walked up to a few places and, and asked for a job. And lo and behold, one of them gave me a job. And I was a young programmer from that point on. And, and I remember reading in the trade journals, which I was an avid consumer of back in the days when we had software trade journals. Um, I remember reading about this idea of, of, oh, you could do the analysis first. Huh. And then, and then you could do design next and, and then you would implement it and the implementation would be easy and, and better than that. You could put dates on those things. You could say, oh, we'll be done with the analysis by February 1st and we'll be done with the design by March 1st. And, and that means we'll be done with the code by April 1st. <laughs> it made so much sense. And, and from my point of view, it was a godsend. I thought, yeah, of course, this is how we were going to work. Why wouldn't we work that way? And of course, everybody thought that way at the time. And waterfall kind of took off. This notion of waterfall was the godsend that <laughs> we thought was going to dominate everything. And in fact, it did dominate everything. It dominated us for 30 years. We tried and tried and tried and tried to make it work because how could it not work? <laughs> but it didn't work. And I don't, I don't mean to say that every waterfall project failed. Every waterfall project did not fail. It just never worked right. You know, that lovely idea that you could set dates on the phases never worked right. The analysis was always done on time. The design was always done on time. But the code, <laughs> the code was never done on time. And we never understood why. And it, we always figured it was some failing with our analysis and failing with our design. The code would not come out on time. It was inconceivable that this idea could fail. And so we tried. And we tried for 30 years, wandering in the wilderness, collecting the manna off the ground and wondering if we would ever get to the promised land. We tried to make waterfall work. And then all of a sudden, one day, we could see. Now, I want, I want to tell you just the level of indoctrination, right, that we, that we had with waterfall. Think, for example, of structured programming. 
Structured programming was invented or discovered, if you wish, in 1968 by Edsger Dijkstra, right? And he participated in a lovely book called um, Structured Programming, which introduced um, object-oriented programming as well as structured programming and a few other things, never mind that. Um, his ideas caught on. Programmers liked the idea of structured programming, but then they asked the question, well, what about analysis and design? And so we had to create structured analysis and structured design. Notice how the waterfall mentality got into our brains and infected everything. Structured programming had to be split into three, structured analysis, structured design, and structured programming. Now, by the way, there were some excellent books written on structured analysis and structured design. They're wonderful. They don't really have anything to do with analysis and design, but they're, they were wonderful books and you should read them if you get a chance to. T Tom DeMarco and Myler Page Jones wrote those books 30 and 40 years ago, and they're great books. You should read them. You just read them with a modern context now. Along comes object-oriented programming in the 80s, right? And, and we hear rumors of this stuff. Ooh, object-oriented, ooh, small talk, something's going on, ooh, ooh, ooh. You know, and then, and then Yarnas Trustrup makes C++, and all of a sudden, object-oriented programming is available to everyone. Brad Cox had made Objective-C a few years before that, but it had a fairly limited uh, um, <laughs> penetration in the industry until, of course, Steve Jobs brought it into Apple and started doing iPods. But OO stepped into our industry fairly, fairly rapidly and then immediately split into three parts. It was object-oriented analysis, object-oriented design, and object-oriented programming. Pete Code. Pete Code wrote the book, OOA, and then OOD, and then OOP, because this notion of waterfall dominated us to the point that every concept had to be broken up into three waterfall phases. We simply could not conceive of another way to work. And then suddenly we could. And it was like one day. One day it was all of a sudden like, oh wait, we don't have to do this waterfall thing. There's another way, we could do a better way. And we started to see books come out. Grady Booch wrote this lovely book uh, in the uh, early 90s. And uh, it, it talked about maybe not doing waterfall exactly. Maybe, maybe there was a, a more efficient, uh, less formal, he didn't really nail it down strongly in, in later versions of the book he did. In the early versions of the book, he wasn't really precise about it, but you could smell the flavor. There was something going on in that book. And by the way, it was a, a very popular book in the early 90s. And then along comes um, uh, Alistair Coburn and he starts looking at uh, processes and, and sees uh, a whole bunch of different possibilities. He called this the crystal uh, array of processes. And one of those processes, crystal clear, looked an awful lot like agile. I mean, now, I mean he didn't formalize it as well as we did later, but looked a lot. And then in 95, 94, 95, 96, the patterns community arose. The patterns community was a very agile kind of community. They, they didn't know it was agile and they didn't know what they were doing about that. It was a, you know, more about design patterns. But one of the papers that came out in 94 in, in, in the patterns conferences was one written by Jim Copeland. Jim Cope, you know, Cope, <laughs> James O. Copeland. <laughs> I'll talk about that later, but he was one of my heroes. In 1992, he wrote one of the most profound books I'd ever read. <laughs> what was it? An object oriented C++ programming styles and idioms. It just, just blew my mind. Anyway, he wrote a paper in 94 um, that uh, kind of took the patterns community by storm. And it was this paper about different processes used by different organizations. He observed many organizations and he wrote down the process elements that they used and measured them based on their success. And, and he, he outlined these process steps. The process steps isn't quite the right word. Process disciplines is a better word. He outlined these disciplines that were very agile, like as you look back on them in hindsight. Oh yeah, very agile. You could feel this happening. And then uh, Ken Schwaber and Mike Beadle and Martin DeVoe and a few other people wrote the Scrum paper, which got presented at the patterns at the patterns conferences, and that was that was a, a much more formal 
much more well-defined thing. All of a sudden, you, know, you, you could tell that something was going on. And this is where I enter again, because I'm at this point, I'm a C++ consultant and I'm traveling the world yelling at people that they're doing things wrong and the people are hiring me and wanting me to yell at them. And, and then uh, I'm talking about, you know, design and I'm a techie, right? I don't want to talk about process. <laughs> I want to write code. I want to, you know, <laughs> I want to see things execute. <laughs> I'm, I'm not one of these guys that gets into the people part of things. And I, I want to see the machines work. And, and uh, my customers come to me and they say, well, we really appreciate all the design work you're helping us with, but we need a process. And I'm kind of taken aback by this because, well, what do you mean you need a process? Come on, we're designing here. We don't need a process. No, no, we need a process. So, so I go back to my office at home and I think about processes and I wrote one up but, and you don't want to know what it was because it was terrible. But in the research that I did, I stumbled across extreme programming. Now I had known Kent Beck for a while because he was part of the patterns community and so was I. And, and uh, he and I had had a number of interactions, not all of them favorable <laughs> because, you know, <laughs> egotistical consultants and all of that. But, but I, I, I read what he wrote there and I thought, you know, this is good stuff. This stuff, this extreme, pro except for the test first part, that's awful. But the rest of it, the rest of it is really, really good. And, and by sheer accident, I was in Munich in 1999 at the OOP conference, which by the way is still going on in Munich. <laughs> and and I, I was teaching a class in one classroom and Kent was teaching one in the other classroom right across the hall from me. And, and I walked out at a break and there's Kent back. Hey Kent, how are you doing, man? And he said, yeah, I'm fine, Bob. And, and I said to him, you know, Kent, you've been writing a lot about this extreme programming stuff and I'm really interested and he said, well, let's go to lunch. So at lunch, we went down to the cafeteria and he, he regaled me with story after story about, about this process that he'd been using at various companies. And I, at the time I was the editor in chief of the C++ report, one of the last remaining trade journals in our industry. And uh, I asked him if he would write a column, uh, a guest column for about extreme programming, which he did. And then I asked him maybe we should collaborate on some classes. And so um, he and I got together. I flew out to Medford, Oregon, um, where he lived at the time. And he and I spent two very interesting days together, um, mostly planning out a course that we could teach. But he sat me down and we wrote a little Java applet together. Uh, and it was an applet, by the way, because <laughs> you know in those days we did applets. Uh, and he showed me test first design, which of course now we call test-driven development. I'd never seen anything like that. I'd been a programmer for 30 years. I didn't think somebody was gonna show me something new, some new way of writing code. But here was this discipline that I, I'd never imagined before. And it was not anything like I had thought it was gonna be. When I first read about test-driven design, test-first programming, he called it, I thought that was nonsense. But I saw him do that and I worked with him. I pair programmed with him on that. And I came away with an extremely different view. And I went home and I learned that cold. I got very good at that. Kent and I and the folks at Object Mentor and Martin Fowler and uh, Ward Cunningham and Ron Jeffries, we all got together and decided to teach these classes. We called them extreme programming immersions. We put a lot of money into this effort. And uh, the year was like late 1999 when we had our first ones. We get 60, 50, 60, 70 people. Remember, this is the dot-com era, right? So if you could spend money on software in the dot-com era. So we had people flying to Chicago and we set up a big room and we built special tables for pair programming. And we bought computers so they could do pair pro. We did all this stuff. We taught these classes. And we taught one after the next, after the next, they were wildly successful. And, you know, we're all kind of looking at each other thinking, well, we got a tiger by the tail here. This is pretty cool. Kent, uh, in the midst of all this, calls a meeting, uh, which he calls the XP leadership meeting. And he has it out in Medford. And all of us go. It's the same group, right? It's, and it's, it's some of the patterns group as well. Ken Hour was there and, and a bunch of folks that were really deeply into the patterns community and people who were into the uh, extreme programming community. Uh, not so much the scrum community, not so much the FDD community. The other, the other um, lighter weight processes were kind of left out. This was all extreme programming. 
And um, there was a meeting there and the meet, there were a lot of things we did. We went on boats, we did, went hiking, we, you know, a <laughs> number of lovely little exercises like you do at these meetings. But the, the, the core meeting, the, conf the meeting that we had that kind of was the most decisive was the one about setting up a nonprofit. And, and the, the overriding um, opinion was that we should not do that. Uh, and I, that frustrated the hell out of me because I thought if this is exactly what we need, not only do we need to set up a nonprofit organization, we need to gather in the scrum folks and the crystal folks and the, the FDD. We need to get all of these, these um, lightweight process people together because we're all singing the same song. We're all trying to push the same message. And I said so at the meeting and then the meeting ended and you know, nothing happened. And Martin Fowler came up to me after the meeting and said, you know, we should talk about this. So Martin Fowler and I met in Chicago and the idea was that we would send out a, an invitation to a summit and I called it the Lightweight Process Summit. <laughs> the Lightweight Process Summit, that was the name of it. That was the, the title on the, uh, or the subject line on the email. Somebody out there still has one of those emails. I don't, they're all gone. <laughs> but, but I know somebody out there still has one of those emails. Anyway, um, Martin and I kind of wrote an introduction letter and we invited the people that we thought of. We wrote down a nice list and we wrote that up and we told people to come and we didn't know where to have it. We thought maybe we'd have it somewhere in the Caribbean. Uh, one of us had said, well, I've got an island we could use. And <laughs> that would be kind of cool, wouldn't it? Let's go to this island. And um, within a day, Alistair, who, who was on the invitation list, Alistair responded and said, pretty much damn you. I was just about to send that same letter out, but you beat me to it. And I like your invitation list more than mine, but can I add my invitation list to yours? And we said, yeah, go ahead. And, and Alistair also said, and if, if it's okay, I can do all the legwork to set up the venue and everything. So long as we have it here in uh, Salt Lake City, we'll do it at Snowbird. And you know, the rest of us didn't want to do any work. So, you know, go ahead, Alistair. Yeah, go, you know, set it all up, man. That's great. And he did, he set it all up. And the lightweight process summit <laughs> was had at, at, at Snowbird in February of 2001. That's a picture of the room. I took this picture about three years ago. Um, I went back to Salt Lake just for the, for, uh, to see a, a client and that client said, hey, let's go to Snowbird and, and see the room. And so we had to find the room because I didn't remember which room it was. Turns out it's the Aspen room. And we found the, the board where we wrote the, the manifesto. And so I scribbled the manifesto back on the board and then we took this picture. And yeah, that's pretty much what it looked like. There were 17 people there. Um, and by the way, these people, you know, all got there on their own nickel. <laughs> you know, there wasn't any money behind this thing. And uh, we just said, okay, hey, everybody, let's go to Snowbird. You know, we'll do a little skiing. We'll talk about software, lightweight processes, right? Okay. Um, and the demographics were, in some sense, you could criticize the, gra the demographics because the 17 of us were all old white men. Well, middle-aged white men, right? And, and so you could, and, and people have criticized that. So, well, it wasn't diverse enough. Okay, fair point, it wasn't diverse enough. On the other hand, uh, the constituents of the software consulting community at the time uh, were pretty much uh, middle-aged white men. Uh, by the way, we did invite some women, uh, they, and they, they couldn't come. And we, we invited uh, uh, Anjeta Jakobsen, and there was some mention of, of, um, of uh, um, Mary uh, Poppendick. And, 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 but the 17 that, arri that arrived were the 17 that arrived. Other than that, however, <laughs> the demographics were extremely diverse. There was an XP contingent. There was the Scrum contingent. There was the FDD contingent, that was John Kern. There was Ari that was there with DSDM. There was Alistair doing Crystal. Then there was Dave Thomas and Andy Hunt. Uh, these guys didn't want to process. They, they didn't like the idea at all. They, they were there because they were sympathetic to the notion that something needed to be done in software, but they weren't sold on this process idea. Steve Meller was there. Steve Meller was the scientific management guy at the time. He was the waterfall dude, sort of. <laughs> he was the big upfront plan guy. And then there was Martin Fowler. And Martin Fowler would not declare himself. It was clear 
that he was sympathetic to extreme programming, sort of. But he would not declare himself that way. He kind of stood back and looked at everything. So, yeah, Martin, <laughs> I told you, he was like the steady hand on the tiller, right? So the meeting was had. And I was the first one to speak because it was kind of my idea. So I said, hey, you know what we need? We need a manifesto because I, I liked the word manifesto at the time for some dumb reason. Anyway, I, I said, we, we need a manifesto, which, which describes the things we have in common, you know, all these diverse processes. And then I sat down and I believe that was my last contribution to the meeting. And then we did the kind of normal thing that you do at a meeting like this. You know, there's cards, you scribble things on index cards and sort them on the, on the floor and you do affinity matches and stuff like that. And it went on for several hours. And, and you know, I've been to these kinds of meetings before and that's what happens. And it always ends up with, yeah, okay, well, we did that. That's great. Okay, let's go home. Um, something happened the second day. I actually thought it was the first day, towards the end of the first day, but other people have said, no, that no, was the second day, so I, I will bow to their superior wisdom. Someone went up to the board and wrote the manifesto, <laughs> pretty much, pretty much in whole cloth. It didn't quite get all of it, but the central concept that they wrote on the board was that there were these things on the left that we like, there were things on the right that we liked. We just liked the things on the left more. And you can see that at the, the bottom two lines of the manifesto. That is, while there is value in the items on the right, we value the items on the left more. That relative comparison idea was the linchpin that locked everybody in. Oh, we're not telling the world that they're bad. We're telling the world that they're good. The waterfall world is not bad. The waterfall world is good. It's just that maybe there are some ideas that are a little better. And that was kind of the solidifying moment, right? Uh, and, and then the four principles came, or the four lines came out very rapidly. I think at least two of them were on the board uh, right away. And then the others kind of popped up through a, a set of discussion. But the magic had been done. And there was this magic. You could, you could feel it in the room. It was like everybody went, oh, yeah, yeah, that's why we're here. Yeah. Now, who was it that stood up to the board and wrote that? Well, there's some disagreement on that. I think it was Ward Cunningham. That's what I remember. Other people believe it was Martin Fowler. And if you look at the picture that's on the screen at the moment, you can see Martin Fowler. It's that bearded fella there with the bald head. That's Martin. And he's clearly at the board and he's clearly pointing at the board. And the person taking the picture is Ward Cunningham. So maybe it was Martin, but I still think it was Ward. And I'm almost absolutely certain that it was Ward who came up with those two lines at the bottom. That is, while there is value in the items on the right, we value the item, items on the left more. I'm almost certain of that. But again, there's disagreement on this. And, and maybe it's better that we don't know because it was the magic moment and it's probably not worth assigning that magic moment to an individual. The rest of the meeting was kind of an exhale. It's like, okay, well, I think we're done. And we still had a half a day to go at least. And so we talked about a few more things and, and we said, you know, we should write up a more detailed document, a principles document, which many of us did in the next two weeks by email. Ron Jeffries took the lead on that, by the way. Uh, and we all left and we thought, okay, well, that was great. Um, and nothing will happen because that's what happens always in these kinds of things, nothing's going to happen. Ward Cunningham said, as we left, he said, uh, I'm gonna put this on a website and I'm gonna write a little thing that lets people sign it. That was a genius move, by the way, um, <laughs> award. <laughs> uh, and um, tens of thousands of people signed this thing. Uh, nobody expected that, but, but it was wildly popular. People were signing this document over and over and over again. The list of people grew and Ward had to write some special software to sort the list by country and stuff like that. Was, anyway, I mean, it was, it was just kind of wild. 
Nobody, I, as far as I know, nobody expected that kind of grounds, but groundswell. Nobody expected it to take off. Nobody expected that 20 years later we'd be having these conferences with hundreds and thousands of people and so forth. We just thought it was going to fizzle out like everything else had done. People have asked us if we'll ever meet again. Uh, the answer to that is no. Uh, one of our members has already passed away, unfortunately, Meg Beetle. Uh, and, and none of us really want to get together again because frankly, you know, it's not like we actually liked each other all that much. Oh, I mean, there's some people in there that I like. James Grenning is a very good friend of me. I have, I have a fair bit of affection for John Kern and, and the number of other people that I, I know in there that I think are, are fine folks. But we're all software consultants and we compete with each other. <laughs> so, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, egos. And I don't think there's going to be another repeat. And by the way, you know, once the lightning strikes, I don't think you want to have it strike again, at least with the same people, right? Just let it be. We did get together again, um, most of us, at the 10-year anniversary uh, at an Agile conference once, but we didn't actually meet. Uh, we just kind of all stood on stage or sat on stage and people fired questions at us and, and we answered the questions and then we left and there was no, you know, no uh, summit of any kind. And I don't think there will be one. And with that, <clears throat> I'm going to go into the second part of this talk. Right? That was the history. That's how it happened. And, and I don't know if you've heard that story before. Maybe you have. <clears throat> Maybe you haven't. But that is my recollection of what happened uh, on that magic two days. <clears throat> now, what is Agile? Well, uh, here's the story that I used to tell uh, in the year 1999 about Agile. Uh, and by the way, these are the slides from 1999. And James, if you are still here, you'll recognize them because you wrote a number of them. How do you manage a software project? Well, there's many options, badly. <laughs> many of us have participated in that particular approach. Uh, hope and prayer is a common use, common way to manage a software project. You know if that one's uh, being done by looking for the parallel grooves by the manager's desk that as he prays to whatever God he believes in that maybe this project can be delivered on time. And, and another common approach is the dictate and motivate approach. And this is where you, uh, you tell everyone all the bad things that will happen to them if they don't make the deadline. And then, and then you hang pictures of people climbing rocks and seagulls flying over the ocean and somehow that's going to get the project done on time. The cost of mismanagement is obvious. Uh, we produce the wrong product if we mismanage. By the way, this is not a programming fault. This is not the programmers who do this. This is mismanagement. We produce the wrong product. That is a mismanaged project. We produce a product of inferior quality. That is mismanagement. We are late. That is mismanagement. Late projects have been badly managed. You can blame them. I wouldn't. Someone's muting. Someone needs to mute. You're drinking something. Is that you, Jane? No, Dave does not. Okay. Well, somebody needs to mute their microphone because we can hear animals crawling over it. And overtime. If you have to work lots of overtime, that's a mismanaged project. Now, why do we have these mismanagements? Well, because there are these laws of physics that dominate project management, uh, often called the, uh, the iron cross of project management. There are four factors, good, fast, cheap, done. You can have any three you want. You're not going to get the fourth. You've got to trade them off, right? So, so the project can be good, fast, and cheap, but it won't be done. <laughs> or it can be done cheap and fast, but it won't be any good. That's the, the trade-off that any manager has to make. And what, what the goal of management is, at least as with regard to these factors, is to decide how good, how fast, how cheap, and how done a project ought to be. That's how we manage the project. We set the coefficients on those factors. But in order to do that, we need something that most projects do not deliver. We need data. We need feedback. We need to know how the project is going in order to set those knobs. And how do you find out how the project is going? Well, you can always ask the programmers, hey guys, how's the project going? Has anybody ever gotten an answer other than pretty good? Yeah, it's going pretty well. Oh, yeah. 
Has anybody ever, you know, heard early in the project that, oh, God, no, it's terrible. We're going to be late. Nobody says that, right? Because everybody has hope. <laughs> hope. Hope is the project killer. Hope is the thing that makes us lie. The purpose of Agile is to destroy hope and replace it with data. And what is that data? Well, wouldn't this be nice? <laughs> wouldn't it be great if you could have a graph that showed you how much you got done every week? And you know, you see on the, the vertical axis here, there's story points there. Well, what are these story points? I don't know, but what if you could believe them? Look at that graph. This team is getting eh, 45 points a week done. 45, something like that. Next week, they'll probably get somewhere around 45 points done. Over the next 10 weeks, they'll probably get something like 450 points done, whatever these points are. Now think of yourself as a manager and looking at that and going, oh, well, I know how fast this team is going. I know how many points need to get done. Ah, that's pretty cool. In fact, there's another graph. This is the graph that shows us how many points remain until the next major deliverable. It's a burn down chart, right? Oh yeah, there's 460, 470 points remaining. And then the next week, there's a little bit less. And the next week, there's a little bit less. That's pretty good, right? And there's a slope there. Look at that slope. You can draw a line across that slope and predict the end date. Imagine being a manager and looking at that graph and going, oh, okay, looks like we're gonna be done in May. Now that might be good news. Might be bad news, probably bad news, isn't it? Because the delivery date is probably sometime in April. <laughs> and now the data is telling us it's gonna be May. <laughs> Agile usually delivers bad news. And then, you know, okay, we want the bad news. We want the bad news as early as we can get it. That is the purpose for putting these charts on the wall. By the way, if you do not have these charts on the wall, you are not doing Agile. <laughs> or at least not the Agile we thought you'd be doing back 20 years ago, right? We thought, you're going to map this out. You're going to provide data to the managers. The managers are going to be able to look at the charts and go, holy shit, are we in trouble? Wow. Notice that there's a funny little bar there on uh, February 17th. That little bar is saying, uh, hey, you know, we worked for a week and now there's more to do. How could that happen? Well, it could happen because the requirements change, of course. By the way, we should be perfectly willing to allow the requirements to change. This is software after all, right? And the reason we invented software is so that we could change the behavior of our machines easily. So, you know, had we not wanted to change the behaviors of our machines, we would have stayed with hardware. But no, software is what we wanted. And so we change the behavior of our machines and we welcome that change. And when that change occurs, of course, we have to change the estimates. And that might be what happened here. Or, or there's another possibility what happened here. Maybe there were no requirements changes at all, but the programmers looked at the last four weeks and said, eh, we really screwed up the estimates on those last four weeks. We need to change the estimates. Either way, we need to know that. That has to be part of the data because we want that slope to predict the end date. These two charts on the wall, right? Anybody can walk in the room and say, huh, these guys are getting 45 points a week done. Gee, looks like May. Nobody has to worry about, you know, what the, what, when things are gonna be done. They know when things are gonna be done. Now that might not be good news. There might be some management to do to get the date to line up with when we're actually gonna be done with something. But the information is there to do the management with. The purpose of Agile is to produce data, or a purpose of Agile, is to produce data that managers can use to properly manage the project. A lot of people think that, oh, well, we do Agile so we can go fast. No, you don't do Agile so you can go fast. You, go, you, you do Agile to know how fast you are going <laughs> so that everybody knows how fast you are going. Doesn't Agile make you go faster? Maybe, maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. There's arguments in both directions, who knows? But if you're doing Agile properly, you know how fast you are going. And that's probably more important even than going fast. Now, let me show you what Agile looks like. This is a simple project. Um, the end date is known because you always know the end date. First thing you know about a project is the end date. Let's call it November 1st, right? That lower right-hand corner down there, that's November 1st. 
And the way we do an agile project is we break it up into a bunch of slices. These are fixed size slices. Yes, I know Kanban doesn't have fixed size slices. Oh, fine, 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 fine. Okay, but the agile, original agile, the way we planned it out is that these slices would be fixed size. We called them iterations. The scrum people called them sprints, same idea. Um, how big should they be? Well, we thought two weeks was probably a good number. Nowadays, I like one week better. Uh, some people like one day, but let's say it's one week, just for grits, one week. Okay, you see that band across the top called exploration? That's where we do all the analysis and the design stuff. And, and, and we don't do that as a phase. It's just done continuously across the whole, the whole schedule. There might be a little bit of this done up front. You might, you might have a week where you're doing mostly exploration and not very much coding. Uh, my people sometimes call this iteration zero or sprint zero. That's fine if you wanna do that, that's fine. But the end result is that we have a group of features or stories, if you wanna call them stories, and we estimate them. I'm not gonna go into the whole estimation thing James can talk about, or <laughs> you talk to James about planning poker if you want to one day, but we estimate them in some kind of point-like style. And then we, we, we say, well, you know, we think in this first iteration, we can get 20 points done. Now, programmers are not good at guessing this. Right? We're not good at estimating things. So, <laughs> so, so very likely at the end of that week, we don't get 20 things done. Now we probably get 10 things done. And, well, that's good news because now we can use that to uh, predict an end date. Eh, well, it's not good news, is it? Because the end date's way the heck out in March and we need to be done by November. But at least we've got a calculation here. This is real science now. This is data. And uh, it might not be great news, but well, I mean, everybody should now get prepared that and this project might not be done quite the way you think it was gonna be done in November. But, but let's not raise a big red flag and go crazy over it because we've only got one data point. Maybe the data points will settle out after we do another few iterations. So, so let's do the next one. We'll do the next iteration. We'll write some code and we'll get the, the story on and, and you know what? Some good things happen in this iteration, right? Source code control systems working better. We've got a little bit of an architecture going here. We kind of know what we're doing and we get a little bit more points done in this iteration than we got done in the last one. And we think we're going a little faster here. That's pretty good. And, and then we do another iteration, right? And in that iteration, things go wrong. You know, they, it's, something goes wrong. The, the original architecture we thought that isn't fitting with the new features. We have to stumble around and kind of fix it. And we're all kind of going, oh my God, this is terrible. And we get a lot less done in that iteration than we thought. Do iterations fail if they produce too few points? No. Iterations do not fail. No iteration can fail because the purpose of an iteration is to produce data not to produce code. <laughs> we kind of hope for code, but the real goal is to produce data. And there's no way an iteration cannot produce data. If you're a manager and you see an iteration that produced zero, well, you know you've got a job to do, don't you? The iteration has succeeded in communicating to the manager that something needs to be done. Anyway, we've got three iterations under our belt now. One was okay, and the other one was pretty good, the last one was pretty bad, we can refine that date. We can do the math again. And see the error bars on that date? The error bars have shrunk. There is no purpose in hoping any longer. Agile destroys hope. And we look out at that date and we realize it's gonna be March. And there's not a damn thing we can do about it, right? It's gonna be March. Well, I shouldn't say there's not a damn thing we can do about it. Maybe there is something we can do about it. Let's look, let's look at what the options are. Remember the iron cross of project management? Here it is. Schedule, staff, quality, scope, just restated. Let's, let's turn the schedule knob. Let's see if we can turn the schedule knob. Let's go to the stakeholders and see if the stakeholders could take March. Stakeholders, how's March? Now, usually that doesn't go well. <laughs> <laughs> because March was chosen for really good business reasons, you know, like maybe there's a trade show in March that they need to be at, or, or maybe there's a shareholders meeting in March that they need to present something at, or, or maybe the money runs out in March. That's usually a really good reason to choose a den date. So it may be that you can't turn this knob, but maybe you can. Maybe you go to the stakeholders and say, hey, what about March? And the stakeholders go, oh, you think it's going to be March, huh? 
You know, it's a good thing you told us now because we were just about to buy a booth for the trade show in November. But there's another trade show in April. We'll buy a booth for that. Great. Good work for telling us this early. I actually worked at a company once where we, we made uh, stuff for the phone company. And uh, we were going to be late with a project. We were going to be six months late with a project. And we went to the, um, the uh, telephone company executives and we told them, that we were gonna be late and they stood up and gave us a standing ovation. Nobody had ever told us, to, no, nobody had ever told them early that they were gonna be late before. <laughs> you, you shouldn't expect that. Uh, don't expect to get a standing ovation if you go to the stakeholders and say you're gonna be late, but it is possible that the schedule knob could turn. Let's assume, however, that the schedule knob cannot turn. Let's go to the staff knob. Everybody knows that you can go twice as fast by doubling the staff, right? <laughs> Now, now, here's what really happens when you add people to a, a, a project, right? The moment you add people to the project, uh, productivity goes down for oh, uh, a fair bit of time because <laughs> the new people suck the life out of the old people for a period of a month or so. And then they get smart. The new people get smart, supposedly. And uh, they, can out, they can begin to add new productivity. So if you do this early enough, uh, you can make it you can make it work for you. And this, by the way, this is uh, Brooks' law. Fred Brooks's law was adding manpower to a late project makes it later. Well, this project's not late yet. It's early days. We've only done three iterations, and we're we're looking at the dates, going, oh man, maybe we need more people. Now, okay, if you can add more people early you might be able to pull the date in. I've done this on projects. There's been a project I did and realized we were going too slow and I added more people to it and we brought the date in. It can be done. It's risky. And also there's a cash flow issue, right? The, the staff knob costs money. So, okay, let's turn the quality knob. Uh, everybody knows you can go much faster by producing a pile of crap. Right? So no more testing, no more code reviews. And I want you assholes in here on, on Saturdays as well. And, this has the unfortunate appearance of working because people do work harder. <laughs> they just don't work any faster. In fact, they work slower. And I won't go through the long rationale here except to say that the only way to go fast is to take that quality knob and turn it up to 11. <laughs> the higher you make that quality knob, the faster you will go. Counterintuitive as that is, it is the truth. And therefore, there is one last knob for us to turn, scope knob. Well, how do you turn the scope knob? Well, maybe, just maybe, some of those slices don't need to be done by November. Now, maybe some of them could be delayed until March. Stakeholders, stakeholders, we're not gonna make November unless you take some of these out. Take some of these features out and we can make November. We're not taking any of them out. You must get them all done by November. No, you don't understand. Look at the data. The data tells us that, that if we have to do it all, it's gonna be March. We don't care about your data. We want it done by, and this little argument will go on for a while, but you've got the data and you know, <laughs> As irrational as managers can sometimes appear, they have to look at the numbers and go, oh, cripe. And maybe they'll rail on about how they shouldn't have hired such lackluster programmers, but in the end, they will say, all right, I guess you're gonna, we're guys, I guess we're gonna have to live with less than we expected. And they start walking through the list of features and they say, well, we don't need that one. You'll give it to us later, right? Yeah, we'll give it to you in December or, or, or January. We just can't do it in November. All right, well, we don't need that one. I guess we could live without this other one. And then they point at one of those ones early on, you know, that we did already. And they say, you know, it's a real shame you did this one because we sure don't need it. We never want to hear that again. So from now on, we're going to go to the stakeholders every week and ask them which one of these things they want done next. And we'll figure out how to do them in that order. We're programmers. We can work that out. But we never want them telling us again that we did something they don't need by the end date. This is Agile. That's how Agile works. Divide the project up into little fixed size chunks, measure how much you get done at the end of each chunk, choose what you're getting done in the, in the order of business value. That's the 30,000 foot version of Agile. That's what Agile is. And put those numbers on the wall so that everyone can see them. And with that, I believe I will end my talk. <laughs> and we can enter in to the glorious period 
of question and answer. Thank you all for your attention. This has been a lot of fun for me.